When people think of Milwaukee, they think of beer. Four major breweries used to call the Cream City home, but that number has dwindled to one over the past few decades. Vanished along with the iconic breweries were thousands of jobs and a unique transportation link that kept the beer flowing out of Milwaukee around the clock. The beer line is only 6.3 miles long and there was uh, 500 cars a day moving on and off that piece of railroad. Hi, I'm Andre Worley. In the next half hour, I will examine how and why the breweries, factories, and the railroad disappeared so rapidly and what has taken their place. We'll hear some stories of a time when a short railroad branch line put the brew in Brewtown and learn how the beer line lives on in more ways than one. Come join me as we go in search of Brewtown's beer days. Even before a construction project took out the old Juno Avenue drawbridge in 2011, there was nary a trace that a railroad once passed through. The beer line finished up here, at the intersection of 3rd Street and Juno Avenue, which was once known as Chestnut Street. Freight was loaded and unloaded for numerous local businesses. Down at the end of the line where the beer line ended is uh, 3rd and Juno, and it ended at uh, what was called the Lincoln Fireproof Warehouse and uh, it's a multi-story uh, cold storage warehouse that uh, back in its time, you know, that's how freight moved in and it came in by train and got distributed by trucks to grocery stores, appliance stores, furniture stores, and so forth. Heading north from Juneau along the Milwaukee River, the beer line passed through the massive Schlitz Brewery complex. The beer line served three of the four major breweries uh, in Milwaukee. I mean, the Milwaukee Road also served the Miller Brewery, but not on the beer line. But down here on the beer line, there was obviously Schlitz, which was the largest uh, uh, facility, and Pabst utilized uh, one of the yards on the beer line to ship their product and actually get carloads of stuff in and their grain, even though the, the Pabst Brewery was up the street about four blocks. And then over Juno Avenue across the river was the Blatt's Brewery. So uh, they also loaded their beer out here and shipped it around the country also. Um, and when you talk about shipping, many times, uh, like I said, they wouldn't, you had your era of uh, billboard train cars when everybody advertised what was in them. And as uh, I guess the world changed, Later on, they don't want to really advertise that you have a carload of beer. And one of the interesting things is Schlitz in the late 60s and into the 70s utilized a fleet of cars that were owned by Dairy Shippers Dispatch. So they were shipping their beer in cars that said the word dairy on the side. Although Milwaukee experienced an industrial decline shared by many Midwestern cities, the big blow for the beer line came when Schlitz closed its doors in 1981. Joel Rast of the UWM Center for Economic Development explains Milwaukee's rise and fall as an industrial powerhouse. Cities like Milwaukee, Chicago, Pittsburgh, older industrial cities uh, became manufacturing centers because these were the places where, uh, where transportation was good, where typically there, were, uh, there was water transportation, uh, there were rail lines, and ideally those two things would meet up with one another. And those were the areas of the city typically that got developed for industrial use. These were not areas that were necessarily ideal in other respects um, for industrial development. Um, you know, these were pretty congested areas. By the time they began to be built up uh, with industrial firms, um, you know, they were built at very high densities because they had to be close to these transportation nodes that were, you know, fairly compact. And so industrial buildings tended to be built, uh, you know, multi-story, so three, four stories, oftentimes uh, buildings, you know, very close to one another. So if, if a business wanted to expand, um, oftentimes there wasn't any room. 
And so um, as transportation options began to develop uh, beyond the sort of rail water uh, constraints that existed early in the, the 20th century, uh, industries began thinking about going other places. The big brewers, uh, the big breweries in Milwaukee um, were located in areas that might not have been as profitable um, to do business in as they were several decades earlier. Um, so, uh, you know, these are areas, uh, you know, again, where the, there's not a lot of room to expand. Uh, where they're working in um, facilities, um, buildings that uh, have been around for a long time and maybe are, are not the most well-suited buildings any longer to, um, to be doing that kind of work. There's a set of manufacturers that uh, are still around, not necessarily because this is the most profitable place for them to do business, but because they've simply been here for a long time. Uh, they may be, you know, fairly small, you know, family-owned sort of manufacturing business, or they, or they may be bigger and they've, you know, simply decided for whatever reason that, uh, that they didn't want to leave the city. And so those kinds of companies are, are still here. But at some point, those companies are probably going to uh, either just uh, fold or, or disappear. It may be the case that uh, the, the people who run certain companies um, decide to get out of the business. Uh, and then the question becomes, uh, what happens to those companies? Uh, do they stay in business? Do they just disappear? Uh, and my guess is, in, in a lot of cases, uh, we'll see those companies not operating here any longer, simply because they, they just, you know, from a strictly sort of business standpoint, they don't have real strong reasons to, to stay here. One of those family companies that has been around for a long time is Metal Forms Corporation. It's been doing business from the same location on Booth Street for 103 years. The company was started in 1909. It was originally called Reichert Form Company. Uh, in about 1919, the name was changed to Metal Forms Corporation. So it's, it's been around for um, obviously over 100 years, uh, been mainly making forms for concrete construction for that period of time. I'm a third generation miller that has uh, been involved in the company. And uh, I'm happy to say we're going strong today, still selling products to, uh, to the concrete forming industry. Metal Forms was just one of many smaller industries along the Beer Line Corridor. The northern section that was um, kind of centered around Gibson Yard, which is like from Capitol Drive over to uh, Holton, down Holton Avenue and kind of surrounded the uh, American Motors body plant, which goes way back, I think it was the Seaman Motor Company. And also other people in the Milwaukee area are very familiar with the very large Pabst grain elevator that was up on Port Washington Road um, by uh, north of Capitol Drive. That northern section of the railroad accounted for about half of the activity. And that's where the heavy industrial area of Milwaukee really was. You've had some uh, huge players up there. The American Motors plant, which was probably half of the traffic up on that end, Plus, uh, well, I know you had Globe Union, they made uh, automotive batteries. You had a couple um, paper manufacturing places. They would either bring in big rolls of raw paper and um, make fancy napkins. Or, you know, I mean, I guess how, what was manufactured on the beer line? And it's just about everything. There was a place that made uh, steel forms for uh, concrete. Um, there's, uh, like I say, various cardboard box manufacturers, uh, the battery operator, there were some dairy, there were lots of warehouses, uh, General Motors, Delco, AC Delco had a large distribution uh, facility. Again, a lot of material arrived by train and then was distributed locally by, by trucks. That steel forms company is Metal Forms. Tom Miller remembers the days when the company moved freight on the beer line. The beer line was used by Metal Forms to not only bring 
materials in for production, but also shipping uh, quite a bit. Um, I started working here in my high school years, and I vividly remember um, loading many a box car and actually a gondola car with forms, and that would be um, in the mid mid fifties. And um, uh, that continued um, into the seventies. Uh, I can't recall exactly when, but uh, we were still doing some shipping um, on the beer line with the siding to metal forms in the 70s, um, but I'm thinking that it probably dwindled at that time and probably by the 80s um, we were no longer using the, the beer line to ship product, although it was still in use at that time. The trend um, was obviously more toward trucking and, and shipping you know, directly to job sites. Um, a lot of our forms are shipped um, to particular job sites and um, rail um, often didn't get near those sites and, and shipping by truck was um, a lot easier uh, in terms of loading, in terms of getting it to, to its destination. The beer line cut through Milwaukee's River West and Brewers Hill neighborhoods, and these were particularly hard hit when the major employers started to leave. Mike D'Amato became alderman for this area in 1996 and found a community still feeling the effects of losses that occurred decades earlier. The east side and Bruce Hill River West neighborhoods were generally in decline in the late 80s, early 90s. Crime rate was high, disinvestment was high. In River West in particular, um, we saw a huge loss of uh, manufacturing jobs with the closing of the American Motors plant on Capitol Drive. That closing, um, the estimated job loss in the neighborhood was about 10,000 if you included those who worked directly at the factory and those who worked in job shops and other suppliers. And so you saw um, quite a bit of disinvestment. Um, housing became more run down. Families began to break up. And poverty really set in. Those were strong middle class neighborhoods for a lot of years. And so through the 70s and 80s in the beginning of the 90s, you really saw a lot of um, disinvestment in the neighborhood and um, the neighborhood conditions really de were degraded. The rail line really became, I don't know if blight is the right word. So with all this decline, does Milwaukee have hope for retaining jobs and revitalizing its neighborhoods? As Joel Rass points out, there are a number of factors working against keeping manufacturers in Milwaukee and attracting new ones. So, you know, if we are gonna have a future in manufacturing in Milwaukee, what sort of business um, really wants to be here, has a good reason to be in Milwaukee. And I think the, the sorts of things that need to be uh, taken into consideration are, you know, this is an expensive place to, to do business in, in some ways. Uh, the, the labor is, you know, more likely to be union labor. It's more likely to cost a little bit more. There's not a lot of land available for industrial development or, or expansion. Um, there are areas of the city that suffer from, uh, you know, negative perception uh, due to, to crime and so forth um, that, uh, that are industrial, viable industrial areas otherwise, but, you know, there are some businesses that are concerned about those factors. Despite the challenges, Tom Miller doesn't anticipate metal forms going anywhere anytime soon. It's definitely trying sometimes. Um, uh, we, we do do a lot of shipping in and out, so um, this location is, is not real near freeways, but close enough that um, it hasn't been a real negative. Um, for the most part, Milwaukee has been positive in, in helping this company conduct business. We're comfortable here and don't have any plans on moving. There definitely have been issues in this part of the city. Um, with some crime and, and that type of thing. Um, but for the most part, it hasn't been a deterrent. Is it the ideal area? <laughs> Perhaps no, not, but I, I do see it um, actually improving over the last few years. And uh, it's nice that the, as far as the beer line is concerned, that they put in a, a path, a, a riding path, a bike path, a walking path. So I, I think that uh, the area is definitely um, improving. That improvement Tom has seen is no coincidence. 
It's part of a concentrated effort since the 1990s to spur new investment in what once was a post-industrial wasteland. The Commerce Street vicinity today would scarcely be recognizable to someone who knew it from the 1980s, a street that was once home to businesses such as the Trostel Tannery and Schuster's Department Store, and lined by a maze of railroad tracks, is now lined by new condominium development. We created a number of business improvement districts on Oakland Avenue, North Avenue, on um, uh, Brady Street, and on Downer Avenue. We um, also um, worked to re revitalize the Milwaukee River and the beer line, both in the uh, urban setting with the new housing along the river and in the, um, the natural setting that is uh, on the other side of the North Avenue Bridge that leads to the Beer Line Trail. So we're very proud of the work that we did with those developments. It's interesting to see what, what has happened in that area, um, you know, since the, the breweries have gone, other industries have gone. Uh, you know, what we have there now is residential development, right? The, these sort of condos lining the, the river that are places where people live who tend to work downtown or in the, the near downtown area, uh, sort of young professional types, oftentimes, um, you know, younger people who don't have families yet. Um, and, um, and those are the types of people, you know, that cities, city officials uh, are very interested in, uh, in, having moved in having moved back to the, the downtown area. So what we've seen is housing um, blossom in those neighborhoods. We've seen retail blossom. We've seen families move back in. And we've seen a great um, a collection of new green spaces and public investment. River West is, is a, um, represent the business community in this area. And um, they've been um, extremely uh, active in trying to, um, if a building has, has been abandoned, trying to get new people in it. They've done quite a bit of work on the Lake Dr uh, Capitol Drive area and even coming down here on, on Holton Street. Um, so uh, so they're, they're, they are improving the appearance of the streets in the neighborhood, and they are very active in, in trying to get businesses to commit to this area. So from my point of view, the atmosphere, the conditions, the um, just the general appearance of, of what we might call River West is definitely improving, and uh, hopefully we'll continue that way. As efforts are made to improve the appearance of the area, efforts are also being made to ensure that its history is not forgotten. This mural by Rinaldo Hernandez was dedicated in 2009 by the Riverworks Center. It will remind users of the Beer Line Trail of the bustling activity that once took place here, long after the last few physical traces of the railroad are gone. For Leo Dorn, bringing new life to the Beer Line means something different entirely. He and two friends are in the process of making the beer trains roll again, in miniature. This particular layout, now we started this about four years ago. This is actually the third beer line in third different house. And uh, this was uh, the custom design basement here that we had a plan that we know what we wanted to build because we wanted to capture just about every piece of the six mile branch line. So we uh, custom designed this basement to fit the layout and what we wanted to do. I uh, specialize in operations, moving cars. The uh, electrical engineer guy, who if you look under the layout, all the wiring is just pristine, so we should really put the wiring out in general public to view. And the third fella in the group, who's the model builder. He loves building buildings, and he does a very, very good job, very meticulous on building the buildings. And it's really nice that we've been able to capture uh, the, the whole flavor of the Schlitz Brewery and the surrounding uh, buildings that went with it and also just in the general geographic areas from the Trostel Tannery Company to Gimbel's and Schuster's Warehouse to uh, the Pabst Elevator and uh, eventually we may have the Corner Tavern on uh, 3rd and Juneau here also. The layout is the result of years of careful research driven by the desire to faithfully recreate the unique character of Milwaukee's beer line. As meticulous as Dick is with building models, 
he uh, went over to the city building inspector at the city of Milwaukee and they actually went into uh, the doldrums of City Hall over there and found the original blueprints for the Lincoln Fireproof Warehouse. And he took those blueprints and made the model that, uh, that we have here as kind of the anchor of the beer line back in 1985, mainly from a modeling standpoint. I took a whole lot of aerial photos of what was left of the whole beer line. You know, at least then the buildings were there. There wasn't much operation going on anymore, but um, we flew around uh, that day and uh, took, took a lot of pictures so we could capture what it looked like from the sky. And again, from a modeling perspective, okay, what went where? You could see a whole lot better from a thousand feet up than you can on street level. Leo's fascination with the beer line stems from a time when it was a constant presence for anyone who lived in or passed through the vicinity of the Milwaukee River. Tom Miller remembers it as a fixture of life in the neighborhood. I actually remember as a child coming down here with my dad and um, uh, there used to be a little guard house at, at the crossing right here at uh, Keith and, and uh, Concordia and uh, there would be an actually whatever that person would be called, he'd get out of his hut and uh, stop cars and, as the trains passed. So um, it was obviously a, a big part of the neighborhood then, and uh, uh, it continued to do so. And when I worked here in high school, um, it was very busy, and um, it was very much a part of the neighborhood, I guess, and, and people were used to it, but there was a lot of traffic up and down um, the rail lines. As I said, I started working here in the uh, mid-50s uh, when I was in high school. And um, among various jobs I had, uh, first sweeping floors and then moving into some manufacturing f uh, functions and then uh, shipping and receiving. And I distinctly remember um, shipping and receiving when the trucks, particularly flatbeds and longer trucks, would come in to on load steel and then to, to pick up the uh, new forms, they had to back over uh, the beer line. And uh, the calves would often, uh, when they backed up, would actually be on the tracks. <laughs> so there was, uh, particularly during summer, uh, some interesting confrontations between the engineers and the locomotives and the shipping manager at metal forms. and. Uh, um, I remember the trains, all my, I was thinking, man, is this coming through and going to wipe out the truck, but they'd come right up to it and blow their horn and <laughs> there'd be uh, exchanges, uh, verbal exchanges that we can't repeat here. Today the beer line may exist only in basements and memories, but the efforts underway to reinvest in the route it once followed will help ensure that Milwaukee earns the name of Brewtown for years to come. The, the brewery that exists now in the Beer Line B area is the, the Lakefront Brewery, right? Uh, it's, it's a very different sort of brewery than the, than the old ones uh, because it caters to that new clientele of sort of downtown uh, residents, people who, who are moving to the downtown area, young professionals basically, um, who don't drink necessarily Blatt's beer or, or Schlitz beer. You know, those old beers, those are working class beers, right? They want the new sort of sophisticated micro brews. And so I think it's, it's sort of emblematic of what's happening to that area um, that, that the old breweries have moved out, that the new sort of upscale brewery now uh, is there. I think, that, um, I think that over the past 20 years you'll see that Downtown Milwaukee and the near neighborhoods, uh, in particular those neighborhoods like Brewers Hill and River West and the east side, um, will, be, will continue to boom. They'll continue to attract young professionals. Um, we still have to create a viable uh, rail transit system that will move young people from place to place so that we can compete with cities like Portland. Um, but Milwaukee's in the move, and I hope that we've put together a foundation in the last 20 years it will help in the next 20. It was uh, an interesting time and, and uh, just part of the um, 
what went on in the neighborhood at that time. So I, I sort of enjoy remembering that that time and those set of circumstances. Unfortunately, um, uh, those days are long gone. But um, anyway, it was uh, it, it's it's nice that the beer line was part of the metal forms history. The story of the beer line is one of prosperity, decline, and rebirth. And it's a story that fascinates people from coast to coast and beyond. We have one person who came from Anchorage, Alaska, and we have two other fellows who came from Pensacola, Florida. There's another fellow who's building uh, his layout in Baltimore, Maryland. And the other day, I got an email from a fellow in England who is very interested in building the beer line and the modeling and, and so forth and was looking for more information. So it's kind of interesting that this little piece of Milwaukee has garnered such uh, worldwide attention. So when you take a walk or bike ride on the beer line trail, try to imagine those orange and black diesel locomotives struggling up the hill with a hundred car beer train. Then. Next time you crack open a bottle of Schlitz, PBR, or Blatz, remember how the beer industry and the changes it went through literally transformed the landscape in Milwaukee. Thanks for joining me on this journey in search of Brewtown's beer days.